Praise the Lord, right now I like to do a refutation of polygamy, and there's another term that the heretics use, so I'll probably name the video by that. I've done videos on this in the past, and of course refuted the Mormons face to face, and... It does need some attention. It's not as prevalent as maybe remarriage or once saved, always saved, or something like that. However, it is out there, and it's not unlike other heresies that take a verse here or there and malign the verse. And when you reason it out, whether it's just a passage to get the context, or it's an overall thought process, it's reason that makes it, okay? So, one thing the devil can do with these guys is he can slip them in into quote-unquote serious groups, and if your fellowship was serious, it ain't serious anymore once you bring in a polygamist or a polygamy teacher. And, in fact, it ain't a fellowship of Christ anymore. The whole thing is backslidden and on its way to hell. The polygamists often will use David. I've touched on David and Solomon and other videos. I've touched on things Moses said. There's one big issue that the Holy Ghost showed me with their teaching months back. I just hadn't got around to doing any video on it. Jacob is, of course, someone used. There's ways to discern the Jacob situation. However, there's one very good way. What polygamists do is they go to basically almost everyone that had multiple wives in the Old Testament. Maybe they won't use Solomon, and they might not use some of these guys that were sinners like Lamech or something, but, you know, Jacob, some will say Moses had more than one wife. That cannot be proven, by the way. It's only conjecture based on what is written, and it's not going to change any doctrine. I don't think Moses was one of the guys that was real prophet and fell into this. I don't think Moses is one of them. However, it's not even a solid argument on their behalf because it cannot be proven. He had two wives at one time. But basically, they, of course, go with Jacob. Okay. The Abraham thing, I think, is really weak for them. And then they, of course, think Moses taught for it. Okay, so I'm going to go into a passage that Moses wrote on topic. And then... In the New Testament, they just have to twist what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 7. Jesus didn't do a lot of discussing any matters of the such. I think it brought up in his dealings with heretics. And for them, they think they have a real stronghold. I mean, of course, you got David in there too, and might be some other guys. But we know that Jacob had two sisters, okay, and then he had a couple women who were servants. He obviously slept with them as well. Now, of course, the biblical doctrine is Jacob would be in hell right now if he didn't repent of the polygamy, okay? That's the biblical doctrine. That's the only doctrine. There is no other teaching. You know, if you somehow think in your mind that Jacob never repented, and God is his God, he being of the living, you do greatly err, because you are unsaved. You just don't understand God. I mean, you don't understand his character, you don't understand the law of faith, you don't have reason, okay? Because you see in the Bible that a guy was a polygamist, and now somehow in your mind you can't figure it out, that it's contrary to God, it's contrary to Genesis, that the two become one flesh. I mean, this is just a problem you have in your own mind. Now, you might not even be a polygamist. You might not even be teaching for polygamy. But how many people do you have around you 
that think that was okay. Well, maybe that's your moral issue at the onset, that your pride has choked, okay, the seed, if you've, you know, ever been saved, of course. These are problems that people run into. And you're going to be damned on Judgment Day once the scriptures have been presented to you properly and you do not receive them. Now, if you're already fellowshipping with polygamists, polygamy teachers, you're already in damnable sin, okay? And that's the problem. That's what the devil used. Get these guys in, slip them in. You're not even in the sin of polygamy. That's nothing you're even in lust for. You're, so you're not guilty of these sexual sins even. However, that's what the devil will do. He'll slip someone in to get you on something else. And it's very, very cheap discernment, you know, if these things aren't crossing your mind, you know. It's of little worth your heart, you know. You're unsaved before God. You're not thinking it's the last days, okay. It's the perilous times, and there's nothing new under the sun. So there's the big dilemma here with the Jacob thing, if you want my opinion. Is you got guys going to Jacob... And then they think Moses allowed polygamy. Now, that's a big problem because they're using a patriarch, okay, pre-Sinai. And then they're using the Sinai covenant and the law of Moses. Both, they're using it at the same time. Now, that doesn't work, okay, and here's the reason. If I go over to Leviticus... And I go to Leviticus 18... Now, if Moses was presented the question, not even on the moral level, okay, it's not even on the moral level, but if he was presented the question, Moses, what would we have done with Jacob if someone comes into this land or is, you know, natural born, that ends up taking two women who are indeed sisters? Okay, what are we going to do about that or what would we have done, Moses? Well, this is what Moses wrote. Okay, in the 18th verse of the 18th chapter, neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. So Moses would not have suffered Jacob. Now, I will say, because I want to be fair about it, because if you're a good teacher of the Word of God, you will use fairness. You will A, not hide away from Bible verses, but you must be fair. Now, the fair thing to say is this, is the Mosaic Law did bring in things that were ordinances, not imposed on morality, but imposed on that people. Okay, Moses did bring things in that were allowed before. The greatest, when it comes to easy to discern, of things that Moses brought in, that Moses issued that do not affect the morals, and that were not balanced before by God, is, of course, incest. There's no way to have procreation in the way God created without incest. Okay? So, Adam and Eve, they had children. How else do you think it worked? All right? One thing you'll notice with people is they have a hard time with incest. Okay? They have a hard time discerning this. This is a person not reasonable. Okay, because they're not reading the Bible the way it's supposed to be read. Obviously, Moses gave ordinances on incest, and it was obviously wrong. Okay, now, when the Mosaic Law goes away, what do you think it is today? So, you have to figure that out in your mind. Not that I'm in incest, I'm not teaching anything for myself, but, you know, you have to think it out. Just because in our world... Things have a bad name in this or a bad name in that. I mean, polygamy's got a bad name and it is wrong. But you have to think it all out, what's going on. Okay, now, the reason why this scripture actually involves the moral law, the law that preceded Moses, okay, basically, another way of putting it is something that you do that is against God, transgressing as the law of God, which is indeed sin, that creates in you a heart that cannot have saving faith. Okay? like the devils, is the fact that this scripture talks about that this sin vexes the other woman, okay? So if you're causing a vexation, which is like being adversarial, okay, this is a moral-related issue, okay, in a sexual-related situation, 
right? So this is indeed an ordinance in the law of Moses because it's ordered by Moses and it's part of the written law. However, this preceded Moses on the moral front. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is this verse is on paper. It's part of the orders and the commands of the Mosaic law. However, it preceded Moses because it's moral based. Jacob was wrong to take the two sisters. And that's all there is to it. Okay. And you can read in the story how they fought. Okay. So Jacob's doings provided a problem. Now the women were to blame as well. Okay. And I think I'll look at that as I move forward. But this right here settles the matter that Moses, even in Israel, even if you think this is only carnal based, it's not an order of God on the conscience based on how you're created, but just an order in the land of Israel. If that's all that you thought, what Jacob did would not have been allowed in Israel. Okay? So these people that teach that the Torah is still on paper authoritative, which it's not, but these people that think that and they're polygamists or polygamy teachers and they use Jacob and Moses at the same time, you guys are out of your minds. You're not even thinking. Okay? And this is an unreasonable man and all men have not faith and these people are unsaved. Okay? Don't take it from me. Seek God. Read the scriptures. But you'll never see a polygamist in the kingdom of God. Those men that are in the kingdom when it comes that died in faith, that had these sins, they repented. Okay? As simple as that. All right? Now, if I go over to Isaiah 4, there's an interesting scripture here. This is the end times. Okay? If you start to read these chapters in Isaiah, it's talking about this. All right? The day of the Lord. Now, this is a very interesting verse. If you go to the first verse of the fourth chapter in Isaiah, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. This is an interesting scripture in reference to the end, the judgment of God and all the destruction that's coming. You're going to get... Seven women trying to take hold on one man, all right? And is there seven women who even claim to be Christian? I mean, I don't think most women are saved because I don't think most men are saved. I think most people that claim to be saved are indeed in heresy and on their way to hell. However, is there seven women that would literally think it's okay and it's of God, it's legal to be with one man? Have you thought it out in your mind? Do you have a conscience? Because what you have is of people with a seared conscience. That's what you have. And this is the stuff you start to hear that polygamy is acceptable. Okay. This is obviously shows the wickedness of the people, of these women. Okay. Because it speaks ill of the women as well right before this in the third chapter. Okay. Of course, the men shall die. All right? So there's not a lot of men left. So these women want their reproach taken away. All right. So let's look at this. All right? Because there's a reference to eating your own bread. Okay? And them going to eat their own bread. They just want to be called by his name. Okay? It's unbelievable. I, I mean, I just really find it hard to believe people consider these guys maybe even saved. It is a real shame to the people that no polygamy is unacceptable today, but then think God was allowing it before. It's unacceptable, and it's a shame to you. Okay? That God would enjoin a covenant. That's what it says in Hebrews 9. The New Testament is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. But there was a covenant that was enjoined by God. And the blood was, you know, sprinkled. And it was well on the book. Okay. And that's what you think. It was enjoined by God. And this is what you think. Now, I understand Jacob came before that. But what was Moses doing? 
okay? What Moses taught out of his law had to agree with the law of righteousness. This is Paul's teaching, okay? So if you like the apostolic doctrine there, that's it, okay? Now, if I go over to Exodus 21, this is a proof text used by polygamists. This is the assumption that they give that Moses was suffering it, all right? In Exodus 21, starting at verse 7. If a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. If she please not her master, who has betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power seeing he has dealt deceitfully with her. Now, quickly to start with, this, I want to make this known, and you can do your own research, but betrothed here is not a correct translation. Okay, so this would be a verse here that the King James didn't do a very good job of translating. The reason why I know that is because they use betrothed as well in our language, English, of course, in other situations when clearly betrothed or espoused is necessary and makes sense. However, here it does not, based on the Hebrew word or the context, which I'm going to prove. However, you can do your own research on that. This is another good case of a carnal ordinance Moses laid out to deal with situations. For example, there is the other proof text polygamists use, I believe, in the 21st chapter of Deuteronomy that talks about if a man has had two wives, and they think that means it's acceptable, of course. Well, it's not. It's teaching about what the man is supposed to do with the sons of the women. Okay, just because one is loved and one is hated, here's the standard in the land. I've talked about that in a prior video on the topic, but it's governing a nation. These aren't what necessarily governs your mind, okay? And people have a hard time balancing that. But what I'm trying to tell you is, this man is done deceitfully. Moses wrote this not to condone deceitful practices. All right? Just like he wrote the other passage, not to condone a man having two wives. All right, so, verse 9. As we would think about it, of course, sleeping with two women. All right. Verse 9, and if he have betrothed her unto his son, same word in the Hebrew as the prior verse, again, not the correct translation, okay? And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he have taken him another, her food, her raiment, her duty of marriage shall he not diminish, Okay, and if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. Now, betrothal in the Bible, I'm not going to get into a big detail here, but official betrothal, as we understand in the scriptures, leaving our society out of it of what it means to be engaged, because it's not the same thing. In the scriptures, the espousal brings an official covenant. Okay, so the betrothal, which is the same as espousal, brings in official covenant and then with the consummation also brings officiality for another set of figures and shadows which they both the shadow to salvation in the scriptures but it takes a lot more time to get into the details of that however that's how I know this was not an actual betrothal because then there's out of nowhere a betrothal to his son okay so it's like a woman in theory, if you understand what betrothal is in the scriptures, a woman could have been betrothed to the man and then broken without a death and then given to the son. Okay, and that's just obviously not correct. Okay, it's not proper to think that you can do that. That you can make a covenant with a man's father and then end up in a covenant with that man later on in the proceedings. Okay, so that's not the way it works. A covenants in marriage are until death, right? Which I know a lot of people don't like that, but that's just the way it is. Now, 
Then we get the saying about her food and arraignment and her duty of marriage. Here's where people are going to have a hard time because, of course, the polygamists want this to mean that you're sharing the marriage bed. This is what they think it means. So, you know, this man takes this woman and he then takes another. But this woman with the marriage bed, they say, has to be in that. So he's got two women with two marriage beds. Is of course, the polygamous interpretation. I know this is not correct either, and I'm going to explain why. It means, by logic, it means that he's supposed to provide the housing for the woman. Okay? They want the housing and the sexual part of it. It's incorrect, but my point is, that's what it means. Now, there is no study that I know of on the Hebrew word. Okay, that you can look up this word for marriage in Hebrew and then find some other examples elsewhere in the Bible to see what it means. It's really non-existent to my knowledge. And commentators seem like they go about either way on whether it means just supplying shelter or supplying sexual rights. Okay, but again, you know, you have to use your discernment. Now, the reason why I know it isn't an actual marriage that we understand that there's been consummation, okay, and you're actually living together in the marriage bed, man and woman. Here's how I know this. Because if a man was to sleep with that woman then, it would be considered adultery, and the Torah would then have you put away out of the land. So you'd be slew, okay, you'd be killed. All right, because it's adultery. Because if that man took this woman, and that was his actual wife that he was sleeping with, it was a real covenant on top of everything else. Even if he had two women like that, and they're quote-unquote both actual marriages in the polygamous eyes, then to sleep with a woman is indeed offense unto death, because it would be adultery. All right. Of course, they would probably say that about their multiple women, who they like to call sisters. I've seen that, you know. Well, Holland says not to vex, you know, the woman and the sister and do that. That's in the Torah, right? But they don't like that. However, the point is, what I'm saying is, if a man, even today, had three wives, okay, he thinks it's all legal, you know, from God, you know, that he becomes one flesh with all three of them, if a man came and slept with one of his wives, he would consider it adultery then, right? If he's being consistent. But the Torah says different on if that woman were to sleep with a man. See, it says here in Leviticus 19, verse 20, And whosoever lieth carnally with a woman, that is a bondmaid, betrothed to an husband. We see the same Hebrew word. I don't agree with the translation, however. It does connect to what Moses was talking about in Exodus 21. Be trod to a husband, and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death, because she was not free. So, you can read this how you want. I'm assuming some of these verses could be read differently without causing a sin allowance. However, what I'm suggesting to you is, if this man was, of course, taking this woman initially as his wife, okay, for another man to sleep with her, is a damnable offense, okay, that should have warranted death, but here is only a scourging, okay. So, I think what you have is the fact that the man who took this woman as a servant, you know, he was supposed to marry her in the future, okay, I believe. That's why I think it reads doing deceitfully, okay. So he was supposed to espouse her and then consummate, which he didn't do. He dealt deceitfully. So he had the options of what to do after that. Okay? And if he weren't to do any of those, then she could go off free. All right? So he had options. He had parameters of how to handle the situation, despite doing deceitfully. The scripture teaches that, here in Leviticus, that you're not supposed to touch this woman because the man has not made the choice of what he was going to do with the woman that he dealt deceitfully against. So in the which there is a penalty for that, okay? There is an offense, 
but not a damnable offense like adultery. Okay, so the man didn't have that woman's wife as we understand by covenant. What we have to understand is also in Malachi 2, a very good teaching on what marriage is and a covenant. It says it, has not God made one? Okay, the godly seed is one. Okay, that's what is in line with the moral law, the law of faith in a marriage is one. Okay, and that's what it teaches in Malachi 2. All right, so in looking at these scriptures, we see that seven women to one man. I mean, that's so wicked. I mean, I can't, you know, it's just vile. All right, and we see how these verses go into play when you look them through and you think them out. There's no reasonable way to fit all this in that the polygamists are giving you with Jacob and then Moses teaching for it and using these verses for that. God made one. Okay, one. And it talks about the wife of your youth. The wife. Okay, and somewhere in scripture, God would be blessing it by his words, and he call it righteous or godly or something. He never does that. And they like to say, where does God rebuke it? Well, it is in scriptures, doctrinally, that speak against it. Okay? But in the same light, provide me scriptures that say he blessed it. You know? And there's none. So I think this, again, comes down to maybe the devil has worked more in a crafty sense, against the people that don't practice polygamy, but a lot of these guys in their fellowships who teach this nonsense. And maybe he's been more crafty with the guys that know it's wrong today, but they think that Moses allowed it. Or they think Jacob was righteous. Well, what are you going to do with the combination here? What are you going to do with the Torah? You know... I mean, reading Nehemiah 9, this is a good commandments, okay? It cannot cause something that we would consider evil today. I know a lot of people, they would consider it evil if a man had two wives today. But they say, well, you know, it's different back then. Jesus came and gave something better. Total folly, utter foolishness. People need to wake up. They need to repent of these teachings. You need to read the Bible and think. Because I think it's very simple. When you think it out from Jacob then into Moses and then what Moses taught in these two places that they proved texts, especially with Deuteronomy 21, Exodus 21, when you think it out and you just do some basic word searching and you go to other places in the Torah and you see this verse here in Isaiah, okay, we won't even do it like it says in the Mosaic Law. We just want to be called by your name. Well, in theory, that would be lawlessness, wouldn't it? That would be polygamous and lawless, you know, for these Judaizers that think that you guys are out of your minds. You need to repent. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made him. Of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bad.